welcome to TV African News. This is Africa Today. My name is Nahabe Kajira, but first are the headlines. The Electoral Commission sets December 16th for Kayunga LCV by election. A new beauty pageant launched to empower PWDs. An Ethiopian MP Ahmed announces government reshuffle. And in our sports today, Oduparanka Football Club confirms Dudu as technical director. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We start with one of our top stories. Now, the Electoral Commission has approved the program for conducting by-elections to fill the position of Kayunga LCV District Chairperson. Now, the election will be conducted on December 16th, 2021. The opposition fell vacant following the death of Mohamed Fefeka Serubogo, whose body was found hanging on a tree. We have more on this report. According to the Electoral Commission spokesperson Paul Bukenya, the by-election program will commence with an update of the National Voters Register from 22nd to 26th, 2021 at the parish or ward level in each of the affected electoral areas. He added that the categories of vaccines to be filed during these by-elections include the district chairperson for Kayunga, chairpersons at the sub-country level, as well as the councillors at the district and sub-county, including councillors representing special interest groups. He explained that the commission has appointed Tuesday, October 26, 2021, as the cut-off date for registration of voters and transfer of voting location in the above-affected areas. Bukenya say the nomination of candidates will be conducted on Friday 29th and Saturday November 30th, 2021 at the respective district headquarters. He stated that polling for the district chairperson Kayunga and other local government councils shall take place on Thursday, December 16th, 2021 at all polling stations in the affected electoral areas. According to the police investigations, Mohamed Fefeka Seruboga committed suicide and the post-mortem indicated he was killed by hypoxia, which is a deficiency of oxygen in the blood tissues. Moving on, the State Minister for Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, Honorable Martin Mugara, has urged Ugandans to embrace domestic tourism instead of traveling abroad to spend millions of money. Take a look at the story. Addressing a news conference at the Government Media Center in Kampala, State Minister for Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, Martin Mugara, said government has made domestic tourism cheap and affordable, which Ugandans should embrace and support their own. So we are going to make a movement for you as uh, domestic travelers, as cheap, as affordable as it can get. And we have agreed as, as a ministry, of course, with our partners, especially UWA, that we are going to open up these protected areas and allow a number of people to go and construct hotels there. The more hotels we have, the lesser the price. The problem with hotels are so expensive because there is high demand and the hotels are few. So we shall open up space so that there is so much accommodation. So you speak by choice uh, for yourself. The minister also expressed disappointment on Ugandans who speak negatively about their own country. Yes, it's true we could differ politically, but this is our country and there is a lot of beauty about it. Uh, yesterday, a few days back, I saw people post about Dubai and how bad it was. But if you see what the other foreigners were doing or talking about Uganda, marketing us even more than the Ugandan. So I know there is there is no country that is perfect out there. Whether you went to the US or within the East African uh, circles, to Kenya, there are challenges here and there. But let's talk about the good a little bit more than the negative. Minister Mugara also set off a group of cyclists from Kampala to Masaka as part of the 59th Independence Day celebrations, which is also aimed at encouraging Ugandans to embrace cycling for good health. Nalugo Muingo, Africa Today. Thank you so much, our reporter. We take a quick break. We shall come back with more news.
Welcome back for the breakers to watching TV Africa the right now we turn your attention to our international news today now Kenya's media have been blamed for poor coverage of the recent expos on President Uhuru Kenyatta's family by the Pandora Papers. Now, the recent expos on the Uhuru Kenyatta family's large amount of cash stashed in overseas accounts has raised more concerns in Kenya, especially on the role of local media practitioners. Our reporter has more. Several foreign media exposed how Kenya local media had gone mute on covering the Pandora paper leaks. They claimed there was inadequate coverage after the leak went viral, targeting some current and former leaders. Kenneth Wandera, chairman of the Foreign African Press, revealed that a number of media organizations in Kenya are owned by politicians who actually get keep or allow what gets out of the gate. Wandera further said that the constitution of Kenya does not bar anyone from having an external source of revenues, but this must be declared to the taxman. Kenya corruption index has been worsening over the years compared to other countries. The East African country has put some effort in the fight against corruption, but still more is needed to help stop this. The fight against corruption has mainly been hampered by ethnicity in Kenya. Wandera outlined that the major stumbling block against corruption in Kenya is tribalism, because once a top government official has been arraigned in court, then the politicians mobilized the committee to say that their communities are being targeted in this fight. President Uhuru Kenyatta said he will issue a comprehensive response to the allegations in a few days. In his response through State House spokesperson Kanze Dena, Kenyatta said the documents would help in enhancing financial transparency. Moving on in Ethiopia, the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed announced on Wednesday a government reshuffle marked by the replacement of the Ministers of Defence and Peace. Our reporter has more. The reshuffle takes place against the backdrop of a stalemate in the Tigri region where the rebels of the Tigri People's Liberation Front regained control of the region in late June and government troops largely withdrew. The Prime Minister appointed acting head of the regional government in Tigre, Abraham Bile, to the Ministry of Defense. Tigre has been plagued by fighting since November last year after Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed sent the Ethiopian army to overthrow the regional authorities of the TPLF. Since then, fighting has also spread to the neighboring regions of Afa and Amhara. The UN says the Tigri region is under a de facto blockade as the delivery of humanitarian supplies has been reduced to a trickle. Moving on in our international news, metal workers in South Africa commence indefinite strike over pay rise. South Africa's Metal Workers Union on Tuesday began an indefinite strike seeking pay raises. Now the union has around 155,000 members working in various industries including auto mechanics. We have more on this report. South Africa's Metal Workers Union is seeking an 8% wage increment and subsequent 20% above the inflation rate for the following two years. Nomsa said in a statement that they are left with no choice but to strike and to withhold their labor indefinitely until the bosses give in to their just demands. South Africa has local plants that assemble major car brands, including Ford. BMW and Nissan for export. Several matches and rallies were witnessed across South Africa on Tuesday as the grieved members called out on the government and employers to heed to their demands. Initial wage hike talks with employer bodies became deadlocked and arbitration failed. Thank you so much, our reporter. Now, the new deputies were designated at the end of September by Junta leader Mahmat Idris Debi Itno, son of the late President Idris Debi Itno. All 93 members of Chad's transitional parliament were installed on Tuesday. We have more on this report. Haroon Kabadi, who was president of the National Assembly at the time of the death of President Idris, Debi Itno, was elected by acclamation but declined citing health problems. According to Chadian constitution, the president of the National Assembly would succeed the president in the event of a power vacuum. None of the deputies designated by the junta leader comes from Wakit, Tama, a platform of opposition and civil society parties calling for civilian rule. General Mahmoud Debi proclaimed himself head of state at the head of military transitional council composed of 14 other generals loyal to his father. 
The CMT immediately dismissed the government, dissolved the National Assembly and abrogated the Constitution. The junta promised free and transparent elections within 18 months, renewable once, and to quickly appoint an interim parliament pending the polls. Thank you so much, reporter. We take a quick break. We shall come back with business. <laughs> Welcome back from the break. You're still watching TV Africa, the right to know. In a business news today, Google said on Wednesday that it will invest one billion US dollars over the next five years to allow for faster and more affordable internet access and support entrepreneurship in Africa. Now, internet reliability in a, is a problem in Africa, where less than a third of the continent's 1.3 billion people are connected to broadband, according to the World Bank. We have more on this report. According to Google and Alphabet both soon the PCI, huge strides have been made in recent years, but more work is needed to make internet accessible, affordable and useful for every African. The investment will support digital transformation by ensuring improved connectivity and access, he said in a statement. The funds will, among other things, go towards infrastructure development, including the Equiano subsea cable that will connect South Africa, Namibia, Nigeria and St. Helena with Europe. The deal expands Google's pledge announced four years ago to train around 10 million young Africans and small-scale businesses in digital skills. Internet access is also hampered by the affordability of smartphones. Google said it will help partner with Kenya's telecom giant Safaricom to launch affordable Android smartphones for first-time users. The project will later be rolled out across the continent with other carriers such as Airtel, MTN, Orange, and Vodacom. Moving on in our health news today, the World Health Organization on Wednesday endorsed the RTS malaria vaccine, the first against the most critical bone disease that kills more than 400,000 people, a year mostly African children. We have more on this report. The decision followed the review of a pilot program deployed since 2019 in Ghana. Kenya and Malawi, where more than 2 million doses were given of the vaccine first made by the pharmaceutical company GSK in 1987. After reviewing evidence from those countries, World Health Organization said it was recommending the broad use of the world's first malaria vaccine according to the agency's director, General Tidris Adhanom. The World Health Organization said in a statement it was recommending the widespread application of the vaccine among children in sub-Saharan Africa and in other regions with moderate to high malaria transmission. Many vaccines exist against viruses and bacteria, but this was the first time the World Health Organization recommended for broad use of a vaccine against a human parasite. Pedro Alonso, director of the World Health Organization Global Malaria Program, said that from a scientific perspective, this is a massive breakthrough. The vaccine acts against Plasmodium falciparum, one of five parasite species and the most deadly. Malaria symptoms include fever, headaches, and muscle pain, then cycles of chills, fever, and sweating. Every two minutes, a child dies of malaria, according to World Health Organization. Kate O'Brien, director of World Health Organization's Department of Immunization, Vaccines, and Biologicals, said that before the newly recommended vaccine can reach African children, the next step will be refunding. In our sports news today, West Nile-based Uganda Premier League entity Oduparanka Football Club confirmed Bosco Dudu as the technical director. Now, Bosco Dudu was accorded 
an employment contract of the three years at Oduparanka Football Club. We have more on this report. Dudu comes with the worthy experience, having previously worked with Kampala Capital City Authority, Arua Hill and lately Calvary Football Clubs. The Caterpillars have been one of the most busiest sides in the previously concluded transfer window with 19 new signings. The new recruits include Shabani Muhammad, Sande Opio, Nathaniel Atamba, Jimen Dalambi, Michael Rutaya, Congolese International Tibo Balemangi, Tabani Wijo, Abbas Katerega, Martin Aniku Oso, Isaac Okello, Rashid Agu, Dud Ramadan, Robert Chitabarwa, Nathan Olora, Yakin Rashid, Ivan Okello, Oscar Luma, and James Jarieko. They also have George Lutalo as new coach and Juma Sechiziv as their assistant coach. Ondu Paraka will host the Amesaid Uganda People's Defense Forces on March day 1 of the 2021-2022 Uganda Premier League season at the Ababet Greenlight Stadium in Arua on 15th October 2021. Well, thank you so much, reporter. Before we end the bulletin, let's have a recap of our top stories. The Electoral Commission sets December 16th for Kayunga LCV by election. A new beauty pageant launched to empower PWDs. An Ethiopian MP Ahmed announces government reshuffle. And in our sports today, Oduparanka Football Club confirms Dudu as technical director. Thank you so much for being a loyal audience from where we started from. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We shall keep updating you. It is TV Africa, the bride to know.